and, and we use it in sermons and we talk about it and we do these sort of things. But you have to realize, and like I said before, I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. It really doesn't matter who wrote it, whatever it is, it's scripture. But whoever wrote it was writing to them and we read it in a certain tone. And our tone, it's usually the tone we've heard it read in. And because of that, we read it the same way we've heard it. So when we read this many times, the way we read it is, well, for when for the time you are to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which would be the first principles of the oracles of God. And we kind of, it's just said. But we have to realize whoever wrote this, they were writing to the Hebrews, Hebrew Christians that were going back under the law, back under the, the, back into the temple worship and all of that. So Paul was, if it was Paul, whoever it was, they already weren't uh, too happy with these people. And you can bet that whenever he's writing this, he's already talked about them, uh, trying to go back under the law, and that's why he wrote most of Hebrews, was why Jesus is greater than Moses, and you know, new covenant better than the old covenant. I mean, he's just blasting everything they're believing because they're going back under the temple. So he's just blasting it. And he's saying, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And, and he even says it in, in language that is very strong if you actually read it the way it's written and not just read it the way you've heard it. But we have to realize when he writes this, he's saying, uh, I'm trying to get to it. Though he were a son, verse 8, talking about Jesus, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So why, why is he even talking about that? He's saying, look, Jesus went through some stuff and he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Then he goes on and says, And being made perfect through the things he suffered, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You hear that? That one verse should kill a lot of the hyper grace stuff. He became the author of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. Not for those who pray a little prayer. Then he says, called of God a, an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Then he says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing that you are dull of hearing. Well, that's not nice. He just called them dull of hearing. Right? That's not, that's not a really, a, a, you know, an exhortation. That's not a, a building up. That's not motivational, inspirational. He, he said, you guys, I, I'd really like to tell you this stuff, but it would be really hard for me to do since you're, you, since you're so dull of hearing now because you shut off to the salvation that Jesus provided and now you're trying to go back under this temple system. You have to understand, the Apostle Paul did not get mad out of the flesh. And I'm sure whoever wrote this, if it wasn't Paul, didn't either. But the Spirit of God in you can give you an emotion based on the situation. We always call it righteous indignation. But we have to realize that the Holy, he, we are told, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed in the day of redemption. Why? Well, because you don't want to grieve him because he's God. Right? But see, we don't think in these terms. So he's writing to them and saying, listen, when, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, what does he tell them? He said, listen, wake up. You keep needing somebody to teach you, and you ought to be teaching others. There's people dying because you won't get off your rear ends and actually do what you already know you should be doing. Yeah. Do you see what he's saying here? This isn't some just neat little thing of, well, you know, you ought to be teachers, and, you know, because you've been in this a while now. It wasn't like that. He's telling them, because you have to realize who is writing this, if it, especially if it was Paul. He was bringing this from a, from a position of, I'm spending my life to get this gospel out, and you think you have the luxury to sit back and do nothing. And he's telling them, I, I shared everything I've had with you. I've, talked, I've taught you everything. And now, because you get entangled in the world, you want to go back into this religious system, now you have to have other people come in and teach you again what you've already heard, and you've gotten so numb to it now to where you don't even hear what's being preached. See, this is the attitude that he wrote this with. This wasn't some nice little, pretty little letter. He was scolding them and getting on to them. Why? Because he understood they had turned their backs on Jesus and yet still thought they were saved. 
And he said, you can't do that. Don't. And that's why he talks about if you go back now, you are, you are trotting underfoot the blood of Christ. And there is no more salvation for you because he is your only way and you're not counting him as anything. So you're hopeless. He was trying to wake them up to say, listen, repent, turn around, come back to Christ. He's better than Moses. He's better than the temple. He's better than the offerings. And we have to realize this whole thing. This wasn't some nice little neat little thing. He, and he said, them, you should all be teaching. Now, why am, I, why am I bringing that up? Because we have to realize we have a certain amount of time here. And at some point, you're going to stand before God. And at that point, he's going to, you know, hopefully he won't be saying, you never even entered into what I had for you. Maybe you got born again. Okay, but you never really moved into what I wanted you to do. And it wouldn't surprise me if he wasn't able to say, now look at this. You see that, see that multitude of people? Those are the ones that should have been saved by your voice. But they weren't. See, we have to realize, that, again, I've said this over and over again, and I don't know why the Holy Spirit keeps pushing this way, because we should just be moving through the manual. But we have to realize, if we're going to believe there's spiritual warfare, we have to believe the reality of what's going on. And we have to start taking responsibility because that's what maturity is. Maturity isn't greater gifts. Maturity isn't these greater things. Maturity is you learning to take responsibility. That's why the, uh, the Apostle John said, my little children, it gives me pleasure, it gives me joy when I see my children walking in the truth. That's what responsibility does. Whenever you do it, that's the reward of responsibility that you see those that you train walking in the truth. You see their lives change and you see them changing lives of other people. You know, the, the, we have to realize that this gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ is such that it should be a fire in us that we should be spreading it as quickly as possible. Not, not the theology, necessarily. I mean, obviously, we'll be talking doctrine if you're going to be sharing it. But it's not about spending 10 years studying theology so that you, you know the right Greek words and Hebrew words. The point is that you get the, the point across of what Jesus was saying and doing and, and what he wants you to do. And that means that you have to rise to the responsibility that he gave. See, I, I said it the other day and I said it again. You cannot claim the scriptures of power and ignore the ones of responsibility. You can't do it. We've seen that. And then people want to, you know, people say, why don't we see things here like people see in Africa? Why don't we see things here? Like, why don't we see things like, you know, Wigglesworth did? And why don't we see things happen like in the days of the Bible? Because you won't live that way. That's why. Well, no, you don't understand. It's all by grace. Then you tell me, why aren't you seeing it? If it's all by grace, if, 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 if the, the miracles happen like that. Actually, Paul didn't say miracles happen by grace. He said they happen by faith. He said the man that works miracles among you, does he do it by the law or by faith? He didn't say he did it by grace. You get in the kingdom by grace. You operate in the kingdom by faith. And the way you get faith is by hearing and doing the word of God and being obedient to the word of God. That's how you get faith. Okay? Not by sitting back and saying, everything's just supposed, supposed to be put in my lap. And if God doesn't do that, then, then you know, I'm, I'm just not going to serve him. Fine. We have to realize that we are here to, to do what he said to do. And as I said before, we don't get to pick our deliverer. We don't get to always choose our, our position in the body of Christ. We don't get to choose our functioning. I've told my wife over and over again. I said, I don't, I don't understand sometimes this because it's like I'm a train on a railroad. It's like I couldn't get off this track if I wanted to. There, there are things that's kind of like, oh, I'd love to do that. Oh, there it went. There it went. And I didn't even get to get off. I was just on the train track. And it's like God is going to make this thing happen. Now, I'm willing to go with him. He's not doing it against my will. But the whole point is that he's making things happen that I'm not making happen. And he's causing things to happen. But it's because initially, and I'm not saying all the reason why, but I'm just saying, you know, whenever I told him that I give you my life, my will, I, I want your will to be my will, and I give you my life, he took me seriously. You know?